So what I challenge people to do is keep a brag book, right? Keep this a pad of paper, journal, whatever it is. Every time you achieve something, even if you don't think it's a big deal, write it down on that piece of paper. Because what I've learned is that when we don't celebrate our wins and when we don't acknowledge our wins, we think it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes time for us to share it, it becomes so much harder because it's just like, oh, that thing? You mean the thing that generated $10 million for the company? Uh, well, you know, it's part of my job. Welcome to You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. You are ambitious in life and in your career, but something is missing. You want to bring more of your passion to what you do, because let's be honest, you pour a ton into your work and it needs to mean more. I'm your host, Laura Eigel. I'm a mom, wife, PhD, coach, advocate, introvert, and indoor rowing fanatic. I'm passionate about living a life that's in line with my values. We'll give you the actionable tips and tools you need to lead with your values, make a difference, and have career success. The world needs more diversity and authenticity in the top jobs at organizations. Your leadership belongs there. You belong in the C-suite. What gets you up in the morning? What drives your decisions? What do you stand for? No idea, not even sure where to start. I use my values to guide my life and career. It's the basis of how I've built boundaries for myself and stuck to them. Are you ready to dig into what matters to you? Go to thecatchgroup.com to download your free values worksheet. That's thecatchgroup.com to download your free values worksheet to get to your core values and take action on what matters most. Welcome to this week's episode of the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. I'm really excited for you to hear my conversation with Sabine Gideon. Sabine is a powerhouse in leadership and personal development. She's the founder of She Leads Network and the host of a top-rated podcast, She Leads Now. She specializes in supporting women and emerging leaders during pivotal seasons of transition, helping them embrace growth mindset, cultivate meaningful connections, and lead purposeful lives. An accomplished author, she has penned influential books such as Leadership Reloaded and Transformed, The Journey to Becoming. She holds a master's degree in management and organizational leadership and is certified as both a life coach and a leadership consultant from ICF accredited institutions. I loved connecting and getting to know Sabine. We talked about so many topics, including building social capital, expanding our influence, and growing confidence. After the podcast recording, Sabine was so generous in connecting me with other women. She is a great leader and a generous networker too. It's such a great discussion. I'm going to get right to it. Let's get started. Well, I want to welcome you to the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. Well, I am just excited to spend some time together, get to know you a little bit more. We've talked a couple of times in the last couple of months, but this is the first time that we're going to be able to sit down and spend some um, one-on-one time together. And I want to hear a little bit more about your background. Tell me more about career, life growing up. Where did you grow up? Tell me a little bit about your family and, um, and how you are where you are today. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. So um, I was actually born in Haiti uh, and I migrated here to the U.S. uh, just shy of four. I I grew up in Connecticut, so I don't know why my parents chose island life and then the dead of winter in Connecticut. But that, you know, it is what it is. So I spent most of my time in in Connecticut. Uh, Undergrad was in human resources. And I started off with, I don't know what HR is, but I want to do it because I had a recommendation from uh, my ROTC captain in high school. Um, So did undergrad in HR, started my career in HR, uh, mostly recruiting in the first few years. So talent acquisition, talent management, talent development. I love that space. I'm a people person. So I love to be able to, you know, get out there at the career fairs. I couldn't do that today. But at the time, I loved going to career fairs. 
And I, I was a learner I, and I still am. And so I learned, I loved being in the space of, you know, combining your learning and your growth in, in regards to building your career. 10 years in of that, I felt pigeonholed in that space and decided that I wanted to go back and get my master's. Now, I should also say when I first started in HR, uh, the organization that I was in, the HR business partners, they were like the coolest people to me. They quote unquote had a seat at the table. They were very strategic. They had these really strong relationships with the leaders. And I was just like, I want to be there. So when I decided I, I wanted to go back to get my master's, it was so I could step into an HR business partner role. Did that, got into an HR business partner role. And in less than six months, I was just like, I can't, <laughs> I cannot. This is, this is not what I wanted. And it was, it was humbling and it was disappointing on, on so many different levels because type A, I didn't have a plan B. I only had plan A and I had driven to plan A uh, for the last 10 years, took on all the dots. Um, the dots, for those of you who don't know, are development opportunities that suck. Um, so, <laughs> so that was all of the projects that nobody wanted, but I figured, okay, if I do it, then, you know, I'll get some recognition. It was just, it was, it was a lot to only get to that point in my career and realize that this is not what I wanted, or at least this is not what I wanted to do for the next 30 years. So I had to do a little bit of soul searching or a lot of soul searching to answer two questions. Um, and these are questions that I pose to myself. When have I felt the most passionate at work? And when have I felt the most um, impactful? And two answers came back to me after you know much prayer and crying and everything else in between. It was when I was sitting with uh, internal employees, like, you know, side by side, whether they were going after a role or they had just gotten rejected from a role. And I was helping them map out, OK, well, where do you want to be and how do we reverse engineer that in terms of projects that you can take on or skills that you need to learn? And then the other answer that came back to me was when I was behind closed doors with leaders and they were vulnerable and they were honest. And the cape and the bravado and the ego, all of that was out the door. And I got to sit across from the human being and I saw how much they needed support, but didn't get. And that's where it clicked for me that, you know, leaders were the most underserved in organizations because of the expectation that they'll, they'll figure it out or they have it all together or because they're so afraid to ask for help or to say, I don't know the answer that they block themselves from being able to grow. So after much prayer and a lot of crying and a lot of doubting myself, I decided, okay, you know what? I can make a bigger impact outside of an organization than I can in. And so I stepped out about five years ago uh, to start my own business, career development, executive coaching and career development, focused really on supporting leaders in transition, whether they were transitioning you know, up the ladder, whether they were transitioning to another different role or leaders who were first time managers, because um, there's an entire identity shift that happens at that space. And really in the last three years, I gave myself permission to focus on women specifically. It's obvious, obviously we're women, right? Like we, I, I would have wanted to work with women to begin with, but you know, there's the stigma, especially when you're first starting your business, you just want, you, you want a client because you have, you have bills to pay and you want to eat, right? But I, the pandemic actually gave me permission to say, you know what, this is the group that I want to help. And having come from traditional corporate, very, very structured corporate, being first generation, being an immigrant, being a woman of color, having to learn so much of the unwritten rules in corporate, I could see so many women of all demographics, white, black, young, old, whatever, who were still in the dark on what it really took to be successful in corporate. And I was just like, oh. I could take all of my scars and help support these women because that's when the conversation around the great resignation and how women were being impacted and how the pay gap and everything else. And I was just like, you know what? I've been on the inside. I've actually been part of, I don't want to say the problem, if you will, but I've been on that side. And I want to take that knowledge and support more women in advancing and growing in their careers and life in general. I love that you just were just so vulnerable in the in your journey. And hey, I wanted to do this and then I didn't love it. So yeah. tell me more about 
that six months when you're in that HRBP role, you thought you were going to love it and you yeah. did not. How did that come to you? Was it just did it smack you in the face? Was it more gradual? What was that like? Oh, it's, it smacked me in the face <laughs> multiple times before I was just like, stop, stop hitting me. <laughs> um, you know what? I got to the point where a couple of things that I realized, right? Cause you know, wisdom comes high in sight. The 22, 23 year old self, right. Who saw this HR business partner role as so glorious. I had outgrown her. I wasn't that same person. I, I, I had never seen it before. So it was exciting. And I held on to that vision for 10 years. And when I finally got it, I was just like, oh, no. The other piece to that is the environment and the organization that I was in when I first got into college was not the same organization I was in when I finally stepped into that role. They had a far more mature like HR model that was very structured and it had already been positioned to support the HR function to be business partners. The organization that I was at when I had this epiphany, they were like 20 years behind when it came to the HR function. And they were solving the, you know, the gap by, oh, technology, we're going to improve our technology and we're going to improve our HRS system. But you've never shifted the mindsets of the people and how they work and how they operate and what the expectations are from the business leaders, right? A new fancy system is not going to change how people engage with each other. So I think it was the combination of I was no longer that person. And I was also in an environment that wasn't even conducive to the person who I'd grown into. It made it easier for me to say, okay, you know what? This is not going to be it. And then the third piece to that is when I really, obviously I could have gone somewhere else. I, I could have gone and taken another job, but I was in a um, rotation program at the time. It was a two-year rotation program. And I knew like, okay, there's an end date to this. Like, of course you get placed out to a different thing. So I had the ad added advantage of knowing that I only have committed to two years and at two years, I'm going to get this break. So I knew in that moment that, wow, if I stay or if I go to another company, I'm starting over to an extent, or this might be the time where like, where else will I have this natural break in my career that I can make this leap? If it doesn't work out, I can always go back. But it was just one of those like between the dissatisfaction, between the growth and just the opening, really, I went for it. Yeah, I think that is so relatable. The idea of you outgrew it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is so common in so many of the dreams that we have for ourselves or the wishes that we wanted. Hey, I wanted this role. And then you get the role and it's not really what you wanted or yeah. it maybe it was, but it's not what you need. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, again, being first generation, being everything like I'm the first one to like sit in the boardroom or like have like an office or a corporate job or anything like that. So for me, that I that was the pinnacle of success compared to that baseline. And so I guess the other realization, too, was I was living my life based off of my parents' expectations. I mean, granted, their expectations were that I was going to be a lawyer or a doctor. Like, that's <laughs> those were the only two options. So I had already failed them. Um, but, you know, the thought process of being able to climb this corporate ladder and being this corporate exec, like this vision that I had of what success was or what it was to make it in America. Those were my parents' visions that I was still carrying. And what it gave me was this chance to be like, wait a minute, why do I want to be in corporate? I only want to be in corporate because I was told that that was the pathway to the American dream or the pathway to success. But I now have evidence. And, and at the time, you know, I, I didn't have any friends who were business owners, but I had I gotten a coach. I had started doing stuff. So I got exposed to entrepreneurship where I was just like, I can make it somewhere else. Before that, I, I thought corporate was the only route. Yeah, it's such an interesting thing then to have that realization and then to do that. Um, what did your parents think when you left corporate? You know, here's the funny thing. In my mind, <laughs> I was going to be disowned. In my yeah. mind, I was going to hear all of this negative, like, oh, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? And da, da, da. I kid you not. I told them I was leaving corporate America. 
<laughs> the most critical people I've known all my life. They were just like, well, you know, you have the education, you're smart, you've made it this far. If that's what you're going to do, then by all means. I love it. I was like, what? <laughs> like, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was it was rather interesting. I mean, my parents well being as they are while they were very critical, like in terms of like, go to school, go to school, go to school. To this day, even when I tell my parents, even though they've worked in organizations, I tell them I'm, I was in HR. They don't like, they couldn't tell you what I did. I was like, no, no, no. You know how when you have to go into the office and you have to tell the people about your benefits like that, that's the function that I'm in. Like, so I, to this day, I still have to tell them what it is that I do or did. Um, so it, it's, it's neither here or there to them. They just know that I'm not on the streets and that I quote unquote made something of myself. They're proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> I only say that because, because they would never allow themselves to actually verbalize that. So that's mm, why I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. Well, what, well, we know that. <laughs> We know that. My award-winning book, Values First, How Knowing Your Core Beliefs Can Get You the Life and Career You Want, is now available in audiobook. Since the book released just last year, the biggest question that I've gotten from readers is, is it available in audiobook? In this book, you'll get to hear my most pivotal career stories and some of the successes of my clients as you learn about the values first framework and how you can take action on your life and career. The audiobook is narrated by me. So if you love this podcast, you'll love the audiobook. Values first, how knowing your core beliefs can get you the life and career you want is now available on Audible and iTunes. So tell me now about what you love so much about what you do. Yeah. Um, one, I get to decide the impact that I want to make. Mm. And that is huge for me. You know, I get to work with a lot of amazing leaders, both men and women, but for the most part, women, because, you know, I am I am team woman. And I get to see women who are brilliant, who are capable, who are hard workers, but they don't see the value in themselves or they doubt their capabilities because of what, you know, society or their workplace or whatever has reflected back to them. And I get to help them tap back into the essence of who they are. I help them see themselves in a greater capacity, which then shifts their ability to go in and boldly command what it is that they want or go after the roles or stop saying yes to the things mm -hmm. that they no longer want to say yes to. And it's slow, like their the confidence shifts and it starts to manifest in ways where, you know, I, I have this one client and, and I'll, I'll forever love her. Like she's a client for life where she had, uh, she was part of a nonprofit. Like she started there volunteering then she was hired in. And prior to that, she, she had been like a Starbucks barista or like a coffee barista. The executive director left the organization and abruptly and they were like, oh, will you be the executive director? There was no training, no development, no nothing. And then the board was very much an advisory board. So she was just doing things like she was just figuring stuff out because that's the type of person. She is a GSD type of person. And when we met and we connected, she was at a point where she was so burnt out because she had just she had just been doing and figuring out and figuring out with no support. You know, I not only helped her get like the board that on board, if you will, and being a little bit more proactive, we doubled the staff. But what was the most beautiful part of that thing was I saw someone who was so defeated and whose esteem, no matter how much she had accomplished with very little guidance, her esteem was so low. To the point that I saw someone who was standing up for herself, who did not back down, who, you know, like she took this very like executive role and to see her like almost bloom, I guess, mm -hmm. if you will, that was the most beautiful part. And that's the part that I love that I get to do, regardless of whether they're in corporate, they first time manager, they're advanced, they want to advance into the C-suite or they're in their own business and not feeling comfortable and confident in who they are. I get to show them who they are or help them see who they are so that they can do the great work that they, they want to do. It's so fulfilling, isn't it? It's so it fulfilling. Is. 
And you and I were talking about some of the things that you teach and coach on. And one of the topics that I wanted to dig in a little bit more on is something that I think you and I see often. We probably saw it both. We both have corporate careers in HR. And I don't know about you, but even during school, like this was how it was. Hey, put in the work and you'll get recognized, right? You put in your, put in your effort, you get the A, put in the work, you get the job, put in the whatever, right? Um, it doesn't, it doesn't so much transition after you get that first job though, does it? And so I think it's something that you and I both see. I know that I have always, I've struggled with it myself and it is a skill that I've had to learn and how to advocate for myself and how to do that through relationship building. So I want, I wanted to dig into that topic with you today and really understand your thought leadership around how to build social capital and use our influence. Because I think a lot of people are doing it, but some people are missing out because we're so heads down in the work. Yeah. And, um, and often those are women. Yeah. It is. It is. So I'll, you know, going off of what I've shared, right? So I had no frame of reference on how corporate America worked coming into corporate America. So very much immigrant mindset, take on all the dots, do all the hard work. Um, at the time when I came into corporate America, I, I had um, I had very structured leadership where it was about butts and seats, first one in, last one out, like that type of leave your feelings at the door type thing. And so I came in like, okay, whatever, like I'll, I'll be that role model worker. So here I was like working extra hours, 50, 60 hours a week, and I wasn't moving. And to me, I was just like, I don't get it. Like I'm checking off all the boxes. Like I'm even doing extra. You're telling me that in my performance reviews, but why am I not able to advance? And, you know, it, it was in one excuse after the other, after the other, after the other. And I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> and I'm, I'm obviously an extrovert. So I had no problems reaching out to people to just say, hey, you know, this is what I'm looking to do next. And when I say that, I mean like other women in the organization. I, re I started reaching out to other women who are in leadership roles um, that I was either connected to through like one of the ERGs. So mm -hmm. whether it was the Hispanic, the African-American, the women's. And I started asking questions around like, okay, well, how do you, how did you get here? How did you advance? Um, and, you know, everybody kind of had their, their different stories, but what really supported me is when I started to look at, and this is not his real name, but I started to look at Bob and something was unique about Bob. And then I started noticing, wow, there are a lot of Bobs here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there are, the, aren't there? The, yeah. <laughs> and the story is the same. So Bob comes in, Bob, he does his job. I mean, he's not putting in 50, 60 hours. Bob gets his job, but within a year or two, Bob is now the lead. And then Bob is the head of the department. And so you see Bob advancing and I was just like, okay, I don't, I don't get it. Why, why is Bob advancing? Then I learned, oh, Bob has learned that the way to get ahead is not by doing all the work and doing all the projects. You need to do some work. But the real piece is in the relationship building. So I learned that Bob was savvy enough to, you know, request skip level meetings with his leadership and that he was, you know, in rooms, in, in having conversations with individuals who were, wasn't just our regular manager or wasn't, you know, the day to day manager. At the time, I mean, this is 2005, 2006. I didn't know what a skip level meeting was. Like, I didn't even, I was in a very structured environment. I was like, I didn't even know you could go to your manager's manager or the person above them and request a meeting to have a conversation. Obviously, you're not just going to go in and shoot the breeze. You're going with an agenda. But that level of strategic thinking of, I need to make sure that my boss or my boss's boss knows what I'm working on knows what my goals are, knows the trajectory that I'm on and knows how they can support me. That was like the piece where I was just like, wow, okay, all right. Now I've learned something new. We're taught, especially us as women, we're taught get mentors. I think that that is a very, very important piece. And I have mentors, you know, for days and I had mentors for days in corporate. But what I learned is the real key to advancing 
is building relationships and getting people to sponsor you. And sponsorship is really, truly the way that you advance. But you can't get some, I mean, you can't just walk up to somebody and be like, will you be my sponsor? That's not how it happens, as you know. It's the relationship building that you put in and really helping them to see how you're adding value to them, to their organization, how you want to support them in their growth and development, that then they want to reciprocate that in putting their name on the line and saying, hey, you know what? This is what Sabine wants to do. I believe she has the capability. This is what she's done in the past. Let, let's add her to the succession plan as, you know, uh, high potential or whatever the case may be. And so that's what Bob taught me that, yes, the work is important, but making sure that the right people know what you have going on, know that you have their back and you can gain their support or garner their support. They are going to be the ones having those conversations behind closed doors that are going to open the newer doors for you. And so you're so right. And it's that magical combination then when you can figure out how to get sponsored and you're advocating for yourself to be talked about in those rooms, that then your hard work and dedication and all the other things that you've already done are going to outshine the bobs that are in those conversations too. Yeah. And as women, as you know, uh, the the messaging around like, oh, well, I, and I hear this so much and you probably hear this too. Well, I don't, I don't want to brag. Like, I don't want to come off like I'm bragging or, you know what, like, I, I don't, I don't want to keep talking about myself, right? Everyone knows a Bob. Everyone knows a Bob, like who has mm-hmm. no problems talking about himself. The question is, at what point did we decide that it was not okay for us to share our accomplishments? When did we decide that just simply putting something on a on deck and saying, this is what I'm working on and this is where I could need your support or this is where I could use your support, that that was bothering someone? Who taught us that? And why I, is that so widespread? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because for my in my own experience, I saw the Bobs and I did not want to be like the Bobs. Mm. I was like, Bob is gross. He is and maybe it's not exactly the bobs but sometimes the ones that manage up real well you know those that aren't that probably aren't putting in the work yeah but they can talk the talk and they know what to say and they're probably taking credit for other people's accomplishments and you see enough of that and that gets recognized that it's it's a bit of that culture and then you don't want to be like that that's how i like oh i'm not like him i don't want to be seen like him i don't but then at the same time you then see him get rewarded and you see him get promoted and so it's a it's a it's a tricky place to be so then how do you do that and still feel good about all the things that you are doing and and have not have that kind of cognitive dissonance of like I don't want to be like Bob too, right? Yeah. But I do want to get rewarded like him. He's figured something out. <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And so to your point, there there there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. Mm-hmm. Where I encourage uh, clients and 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 people in my community is there are a couple of things you know, when we accomplish something, right? And I don't know about you, I I have a a lot of type A people in my community, right? We've accomplished something and we're on to the next. Like, okay, yep, done. All right, next thing, right? We don't, we don't even celebrate those accomplishments or anything. We do not, we do not. (laughs) It's like next. So what I challenge people to do is keep a brag book, right? Keep this pad of paper, journal, whatever it is. Every time you achieve something, even if you don't think it's a big deal, write it down on that piece of paper. Because what I've learned is that when we don't celebrate our wins and when we don't acknowledge our wins, we think it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes time for us to share it, it becomes so much harder because it's just like, oh, that thing, you mean the thing that generated $10 million for the, uh, well, you know, it's part of my job. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. And, and so I think it starts with us acknowledging our own achievements and our own accomplishments outside of, you know, Bob, outside of trying to use it to get a raise or anything like that, that it builds that self-confidence and that self-awareness of these are the amazing things that I'm doing. Now, when we have this evidence and we can go into a conversation with our manager and another project is coming up, or maybe it's the performance review or something like that, we have something that can say, you know what, I was actually just looking through this list of 
things that were priorities. And, you know, I, I was rather surprised. These are the things that I've been able to accomplish. So obviously I'm giving this example because that's how I would feel comfortable doing it. But I think if for those of you who are listening, whether you're introverted, whether you don't want to be associated with the, the Bob or you have these messages that, you know, my work will speak for itself. Yes. And yes. Mm -hmm. And, but start with acknowledging your own achievements because I think it's when we can acknowledge our own achievements, then we're more comfortable sharing it with others. And then we will see that other people acknowledge it. And then that's when you start to build that confidence. And, and I know there's like this expectation that at some point someone's going to tap you on the shoulder. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Most of the time it doesn't. Most of the um, time it doesn't. Well, yeah. you, you've been in those rooms and those HR conversations and it's up to the person at the end of the day to own their career and to give the narrative up or across or all over on the things that we're doing. And so if my manager doesn't know like the most important things, then how are they going to share that? Or if I don't, like you said, get that in front of the skip level, how will they know? The other thing that I also see kind of on the other side, as you, as you're talking about building accomplishments and talking about it. The other thing that I would see a lot as a manager and from a talent development perspective, when I would see everybody's comments at the end of the year, you know, your objectives and you've said, okay, here are all the things that I did. And then sometimes I would see women write, like, I kid you not 10 to 15 pages, but it was like, it was just a ton of data. And it wasn't, there was like gold like in it, but you couldn't find it. And so people would just kind of gloss over it, but they wanted to say, here's all the things that I did. And so it was like a novel. They wrote this like ginormous thing that like actually didn't get read because it was so dense. And so as we get better at identifying our accomplishments, even brevity about what are your, like, how can you tell that story? not in a sound bite, but in a, in a way that people will remember and not just kind of in this big, long list of a data dump. That's another thing that I see often as well. Yeah. And you can't wait until that one time a year yeah. or the twice yeah. a year. Like there's, you know, there's the recency bias, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's everything. So you need to make sure that if it's a big win, and it is like, it needs to be acknowledged in the next one-on-one. -on -one. Like, so there, right. there's now you've created a track record of sharing wins as they're happening so that, you know, yeah. come, come the end of the year, you're not trying to remember everything and list everything out. You can just say, okay, these were the high things. Um, and your manager will remember those things because you've already had that conversation. One other thing too, because you, you made a point about in those rooms, especially like during talent review. Right. I think that this is another area where at least my clients, especially if they're on the exec track, you ask the question, well, we're who's success. Like when it comes to the succession planning, are, have you been identified as anybody's successor? And I don't know about you, but a lot of times my clients are like, oh, well, I don't I don't know. I'm not privy to that. I don't know. And it's like, again, we're HR people. So we know that. And that's always that's not necessarily something that organizations will willy nilly share. But if you have a desire to be on that leadership trap or that executive trap, asking the question, you know, am I, have I been identified? Or, you know, when it comes to the talent review, like having the conversation with your manager, being bold enough to say, hey, I'd love to know where, where that falls. I can say being in HR, consulting for HR, not a lot of women, I don't know if men do it quite frankly, but I know not a lot of women we'll even ask that question of where am I on the list? And we all know the list exists. And I think that the organization's way of trying to protect, you know, I, I get the risk that comes along with them putting out this information, but that is something that you need to know so that one, if you're working towards a particular track and your leadership has something else in mind for you and you don't mm -hmm. even know that, like it could be that rabbit, right? Like you're spinning your wheels trying to get here, but they want to see you here. That's another way to hinder you in your career and your advancement as well. Yeah. And I think it's important to be knowledgeable about the, the talent management process where you are, even at small companies, they probably don't do it as well as big companies, but there's some kind of talent review where they look at their talent. They understand what are their key positions 
and they do some kind of succession planning for mm -hmm. key roles. And so what we're talking about is, do you know what those key roles are and which key roles are you hopefully on the succession plan for? And so if somebody leaves or gets promoted, they have a list, a literal list of people who they've been developing or thinking about who would take that leader's place in that role. It's, it's about risk mitigation for companies. It's about talent development. It's about lots of different things. Um, so they do those kinds of conversations a lot. And so if you don't know how that works within your company, I think that's a really important thing to understand, to have a conversation with HR, to have a conversation with manager around the time that they're having these talent reviews. Like what was the outcome of the review? Am I on this role or that role? And sometimes they'll tell you in terms of the metrics are usually like, you're ready now, you'll re be ready in one to three years or three plus years or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so understanding where, to your point, where the organization sees you and then ensure that that's in line with the roles that you want to be in too, I think is going to be really important. And then to have those candid conversations um, with your manager is going to be really important and your, or whoever your sponsor is. Yeah, absolutely. I remember um, at one point I was told, oh, you've been identified as a high potential. I was like, great. What does that mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like what, what do I get as a result yeah. of this, right? Like what's going to happen? Is there a program? Am I being fast tracked? Like, what does that mean? And that's another thing like, okay, well, if you are identified as a high potential, what does that mean? What yeah. is required? Even the language around, you know, ready in, in two to three years or whatever. I'm telling women, if you hear that, ask them, what does that mean? Because what does that ready? mean? Yeah, absolutely. Because how am I getting my, how are you and how are, am I getting myself ready? What experiences do I need to show you that I am ready in that time? Because the time will pass no mm -hmm. matter what. And often the same roles that people are identified in one to three years, in one to three years, they're still on that same list. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Or it's the, you know, people are thinking to themselves because you haven't necessarily done whatever they've identified, like, oh, she, she just needs to be in the role for a little longer, or you need a little bit more seasoning, or, you know, you just need a little bit more time, like get specifics. Like that should be part of your development plan. That should be part of the conversations that you're having that, oh, okay, I'm ready in two to three years. Cool. What are the competencies that I need to learn? What are the skills that you think that I'm missing today so that I can start to build towards that? That is part of now you're having, this goes back to what we're talking about. Now you're having these regular conversations with your manager. You're sharing, well, you know what? You said that I really need to, to work on my ability to manage an L, um, a p &L, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, what are some of the things that I can do to take off your plate to manage the budget? Or maybe this is what I've done. And so you want to make sure that these conversations that you're having around your advancement tie back to something specific to the organization and, and something of course specific that they said, this is where you might need some development. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you like to help women, you know, step out to have some of these conversations? Is it, you mentioned before through relationship building through, it seems like asking questions, like what other things should they be thinking about um, to have some of these, these important conversations to build the careers that they want? Yeah, great question. So I would imagine many of us have set our, our sights on what we want to accomplish in 2024, right? So as of the time of this recording. So if you haven't already, I mean, it, set the intention. What do you want to achieve this year? Like, we don't, we don't want to wait until December of like, oh, well, you know, what do I want this year to look like? Or even June for that matter. Set the intention of what you want to achieve. So if you're, if it's December 31st, 2024, and you're looking back at your, your career, what are the things that you are going to want to be proud of? Once you've identified those things, and it may be, you know, it may be a stretch assignment, it may be, you know, the next level, whatever that looks like. Now go back and ask yourself, who do I know or who do I need to support me with this? And I think that's huge because what I used to do, what I've seen clients do, what I'm sure you're doing oh, okay, these are all the things that I want to accomplish. I'm going to figure out how to get them done. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to plan around them. Mm -mm. No, that defeats the whole purpose. Start with what you want to accomplish and then start to identify who can help me. And that could be people in your organization. That could be people outside of your organization, right? So if you don't have mentorship, 
who, who are some of the role models or people that I trust that could be my mentors to help me advance in this particular perspective. If you, if it's your manager, identifying that. So I have this thing, um, I call it the success circle, right? So it's key people that you should have in your, in your circle or your board of directors. And that is a sponsor, which is going to be a longer, you know, a longer term thing as you're building the relationship for them to step into that role. But mentors, at least one to two mentors within the organization, your manager, of course, because I think that that's the most important relationship that you have, um, peers, right? And they can be cross-functional peers within the organization who you can, uh, they either have a skill set or you, they can just be your sounding board. Um, you want to make sure that you are, uh, you include a super connector. And so the super connector is that person in that organization or the people in the organization who they know everything, they know everyone. And if you've ever built relationships with, or if you've never built relationships with executive assistants, start building relationships with executive, they know where the bodies are, <laughs> are. And so they are more than likely to be the one to say, oh, okay, well, you'll want to meet with this person and you'll want to connect with this person. And then also, depending on where you are in your career, a mentee. So someone who you can pour back into. So once you have your success circle, right, you've identified the people who are in your success circle, you've notified them that they are members of your success circle and how you want them to support you. Go back to that list of accomplishments or the things that you want to accomplish this year and then identify, okay, I, I said, you know, Melissa, who's the peer, I want to do this. She's very skilled at that. I'm going to leverage her to partner in, in building the skill set or working on this project, or I wanted to do this, you know what, Mike is really great at that. I'm going to reach out to Mike to help me. So you're starting with what it is that you want to do. You've identified now these uh, people in your success circles, and now you're going to reach out to them and say, hey, this is what I'm looking to accomplish. This is where I need your support. So it allows you to continue to build those relationships effortlessly, and it allows you to get your stuff done, the, the things that you want to accomplish and achieve with people who have the capacity or the competency or the skill set, whatever that might be, to help support you in that space. I love bringing in the who so early. I think that is going to be a big difference in how, if you're listening to her advice, that's the key differentiator. Because before... It would have just been like, okay, I'm going to dig into the details and I'm going to do the thing myself probably, right? Yeah. But bringing in all of those other people, you're making it known what you want, that you want their help or their partnership, like automatically you're putting them on notice as like, hey, I'm going to come to you. You're going to be hearing from me, which means we get to celebrate accomplishments together. And it's, it's some accountability too. Yes. Yes. And that's the strategic way in building the relationship and making sure that you're chief. And it's always a win-win, right? It's always a win-win because these people who are going to say yes, they want to support you. It, it, it's what we've been mm -hmm. talking about. Like there's a fulfillment in that and vice versa. You may end up on their success circle and mm -hmm. you have a skill set that you can help them with. So it's just, it's taking our careers. I remember when I first, and you said it too, when I first got into corporate America, I was told you own your own career. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> And I was just like, oh, OK, but really, we get to own our own careers. So I, I, I would love to see a day where, you know, not that everybody's going to like be at the C-suite, but for those who desire that whatever past messagings or narrative is just like, no, I don't I don't I'm not subservient to that, that I can move mm -hmm. past that because I'm being very strategic. The work needs to get done. Yes. But I'm also here to grow. I'm also here to learn. I'm also here to make an impact. And who are the people who are already here in this organization who can help me do that? Or if you have to seek external resources, how do I invest in myself, in time, in money, and whatever else to get the help that I need to make that happen? I love it. And I think you're right. It's, it's both internal and external. I'm seeing a lot more people do that and rely on their external networks, coaches, peer support, like all of those kinds of things as they navigate their careers now. Well, I have just so enjoyed our conversation and I, you've given such actionable tips for people to think about. What is the best way for us to connect with you? Yeah. Thank you for that question. And it's been a, a great conversation for me as well. Um, so the best way is either LinkedIn. Uh, I live on LinkedIn. So it's Sabine Gideon. Or I have a podcast as well, She Leads Now, uh, which will have a new name soon, but you'll still be able to search of She Leads Now. 
Um, so if you are into hearing about, you know, female empowerment, how to how to really stand in our power uh, mindset and as well as networking and building the social capital, that's where we focus on in that on that show. So you can check it out on She Leads Now podcast. Perfect. Well, we'll put all of that in the links in our show notes. So thank you so much again today for sharing your thought leadership. And it has been a, a great time just to talk shop and to be in the same space with you today. Thank you. Same here, Laura. I want to thank you so much for listening to the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. If you are enjoying this content, please remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. By leaving a review, you are helping others find this content. We will be featuring five-star reviews on air in upcoming episodes. Editing and support for the podcast is done by S&E Podcast Management. To get more tips and tools to help you live a life guided by your values, go to thecatchgroup.com. Keep your boundaries and take care.